Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here to our illustrious free speech gathering and forum tonight. Uh, there are two simple rules to the College of Complexes. The first one is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, there will be a brief announcements period. Second, our speaker will then speak up to about an hour. Third, we have our infamous question and answer period, and we ask at that time that you have a question and not a statement, because at the end of the question and answer period, you'll all have a chance to uh, rebut, usually about four minutes each, and then at the end of the night, our speaker will get the last word. Let's introduce our speaker for tonight, Andy Williams, Jr., who's running, who's a presidential candidate for president on a human rights platform and it promises to serve as a model citizen. To quote uh, Andy, I am running on a human rights platform. I am a former gang leader, drug dealer, and have been in two prison. My stepbrother is white, and I grew up in a middle class home with my father. Based on society's idea, I had a good upbringing. I am running for president because I care about the future of my granddaughter and our society, and how and our society has moved away from morals and principles. I want to be a model chief citizen for America. I am working on a changes by creating a vocational entrepreneurship school for the disenfranchised. I believe in one race, the human race. The current policies only seem to focus on Democrats and Republican views, and not the views of the people that are supposed to be serving or representing. My platform stays the same regardless if I'm president or not. Our campaign is about doing the work we believe in now. Let's welcome with a rousing round of applause, Andy Williams, Jr. Hey, how y'all doing? Great. The microphone is working. Yes. Listen, <clears throat> let's get straight to the point. Everybody wants to make America great, right? How do we make America great is the question. It's a real simple answer. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That is about the simplest way to ever make America great. See, what our platform, me, is saying, when I grew up, my stepmom was white. So I grew up in a biracial home, period. I didn't grow up in the ghetto like everybody else saying, oh, I got this situation. And I, I, I understand how people grow up, but at some point you have to grow up. You have to grow up. And that's the position I'm at today to say, there's nobody who could represent my interests better than me. A lot of us in here probably was affected by the foreclosure crisis, what I say. It's not directly, some indirectly. I was put in foreclosure. It was a wrongful foreclosure. And I fought it for 13 years. 13 years. Most of the time I was fighting the pro se without an attorney because I had to do the own, my own research. I had to do my own reading to understand what happened. And my, my foreclosure started in 2004, not in 2008. So I was pretty ahead of the game when it happened. My mother retired. Her savings, she's working right now as a result of the foreclosure crisis. That affected every single body. And the, the, the TARP funds that Barack Obama gave out, because he didn't need two-thirds of Congress to, to rule on that. The guy who managed the TARP funds, Robert Kelly, was a CEO, which he currently still is, a CEO of Bank of New York Mellon. That was a plaintiff in my foreclosure case. Now, how did that happen? Do we not do background checks? Is this all just about buddies? We put whoever we want to, to manage this? And that buddy-buddy system? is why our country's in the position it is now. We don't get people that's qualified, we just qualify the people because we like them. That's not how we're supposed to run a country, that's not how we're supposed to run a nation. And when I look at my generation, we're a generation who have overcome a lot, lot of things. Like I said, I've been to, get, I've been to prison when my stepmom uh, separated from my father, because no, I, no, I no longer had a balanced two-parent household. I started hanging out with the gang members. There was no accountability for me to, 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 to come home because my dad owned his own business, an entrepreneur, so he wasn't there when I got home. So I learned his schedule, and I started hanging out with my friends, and they didn't influence me, I influenced them. I was a, the head troublemaker, the one leading all the stuff astray, and I wind up going to jail, you know, uh, for, for a robbery. 
And when I got out of jail, I got introduced to the drug game and I started selling drugs and three months later I was back in the county jail. Uh, I was given a law library pass and I beat the case in a bench trial and I fell in love with the law at that point. However, I didn't fall in love with the law to be a lawyer. I fell in love with the law to know how to get across the law and just start selling more drugs. If I knew my rights, then I knew what I could get away with. That foundation, once I turned my life around, is what helped me fight my foreclosure. Now, I'm not a candidate that's going to promise you I'm going to do all these great things. Because if you really could do all those great things, you would have been, did them already. It takes two-thirds of Congress to pass any legislation other than certain powers that the president has that's guaranteed by Article 2 of the Constitution. That's where my job description comes in, what I can do as an individual. I believe in a flat tax for everybody. 10%. Flat tax. That's all we need. Because we have so much wasteful spending in government, the money never gets down here to, to Main Street where we're at. Where we're at. And do I believe in self-insured? I do. Harris Rosen, he's a hotel connoisseur out of Florida. He's got the Rosen Care health care program. Self-insured is what he does with his people, meaning he already has the blueprint. He's been doing this for over 20 years. How do we give health care insurance to people who can't afford it? His is a single payer, uh, $750 a year. For a family, it's $2,200, $2,300. So well, I can't afford that. That's where the government comes in with aid and assist. Because what has happened is the government is in a position where they keep us oppressed in bondage. Why? Because we keep asking them to solve our problems. I'm a libertarian, so I believe in limited government. And I believe we all should believe in limited government because the government is what dictates where you're going to eat, where you're going to sleep, when the gas prices go up. Um, I just saw today that their, uh, the Afghanistan war, they, they should be coming home because there might be a peace treaty. Well, hell, we should have been there did a peace treaty. How do you go in somebody else's backyard and somebody else's uh, uh, place where they live at and say, we're going to take this, we're going to do this? I... Um, Watched the documentary A and E about Osama bin Laden probably about seven, eight years ago, and it amazed me that I'm seeing Bush and the Clintons on this documentary with Osama bin Laden. This is from A and E, and I wondered, was that whole position done because somebody was retaliating for something that happened to them? Which I do agree with Donald Trump when he says fake news because it's biased. We only hear one side of the story. We only hear what the media tells us. What's the other side of the story? There's always two sides of the story, three sides of the story. Their side, the other side, and the truth. I stand for truth no matter who tells it, no matter who it comes from. That's what I believe in. And as a candidate seeking every last one of your votes in here. Now today I'm sowing a seed. Some of y'all might want to sow a seed to donate to my campaign today, and I welcome that. You know, $2,700 is the most check y'all can write. Just thought I'd throw that out there. But I can assure you that what the Constitution says, that we are guaranteed rights that are given to us by our Creator, that's something we all can uphold for our own self and limit the government from being in our business. How many times does the government tell you, well, I'm taking 40% out of your check? How does the government do that? What have they done to earn that money? Why do we have to work to give them money? Why do they take whatever they want whenever they want. And our libertarians, they talk about taxation as theft. I agree with it. Taxation without representation is wrong. Now, this room is the people that grew up in the 1960s. They remember in the 60s, they had the Black Power Movement, the hippies, and the hippies wanted to legalize marijuana back then. Why didn't we do it back then? Where would we be at a country today? Way more peaceful. Peaceful, that's what we want, peace. Peace in our homes, peace in the streets, peace in our community. And the only way to get peace is through freedom. Freedom should be our only issue. Not freedom for one, freedom for all. That's what it is. We talk about human rights matter, black lives matter. How about this? Respect matters. How about you just give me some basic respect? When you see an elder walking through the door, don't cut them off. See, our generation has, has not seen that uh, uh, behavior modeled before them. So they don't know. And then we get upset because they don't know. Well, it's time we slow down. 
to start teaching our neighbors, our, I mean, teaching this next generation, this is what it's like to respect somebody. Respect is something we all can do without a vote. Do you understand that? We can just respect somebody and we don't have to vote on that. And then I say, well, how would you defeat Donald Trump, Andy? Well, I am a minister, okay? And I draw a lot of inspiration from the stories in the Bible. And it's a story in the Bible about this dude named David, 1 Samuel 17, 32. David went up against Goliath. And Goliath was like, who is this? Who is this little dude right here? Think he can get me? Because Goliath had been a bully, just like Donald Trump's a bully. And David slayed the, the, Goliath, the, the Goliath, which was a giant. I won't disrespect Donald Trump as, a, as, a, as an elder, because he is one of my elders. But he's a big bully. He's like a 13-year-old man in a 72-year-old body, just bullying around people because he knows the art of the deal. That's what he's using his position as, to deal with people. And we sit there and we say it's okay. And even with, with, with Bernie Sanders and the other candidate, again, I respect them, but if you've been in Congress longer than four years, and you have not made necessary implementation, why would I keep voting for you to keep promising me you're going to do something that you haven't done in all the time you've been in office? Because if the only thing you've got to do is vote on a bill and that's what matters, that's not public service. Our elected officials should be serving us. They should know us. They should know what's going on in our communities, and they should address that. And a lot of times we want to introduce new bills. Why don't we just follow the Constitution? What's wrong with that? Why don't we enforce what's already in place instead of trying to do a new thing? Because that's what we keep doing. And the new thing means we've got to waste more new time. Look at Bloomberg comes into the race, spent, let's say, over $400 million. I just remember last time, $147 million. Do you know what that money could do for education if we just built schools with that money? Why would you spend that type of money unless you wanted a position of power to continue to pass legislation or rules to oppress us. Because that's what the government has been doing. And it's not totally their fault, it's our fault. How many of y'all would let the government come in your house and tell you when you could wake up? When you could go to sleep? Where you could drive? Where you could, and that's what they're doing. They're locking us up in our own communities. Taking our, our, our retirement income. And there's no accountability. There's been no accountability for what has happened in that foreclosure crisis of 2008. Who was held accountable for that? We were. The taxpayers had to pay that back because somebody went in, robbed some stuff, got away with it, and then we had to pay back what they robbed from us. Like, isn't that like some kind of twisted scenario? You steal from me and I gotta pay you back for stealing from me? How do we do that? And that's because we, as the government, is more about representing their parties instead of representing the people. And that's why I come to you as a human right candidate. A candidate that's here for human rights. The fact that I'm a human and you're a human, that's what matters. Not the fact that you're black or, or, or I'm white or, or you're Hispanic. We're humans. And humans should respect other humans. And if I'm in a position to help you, it doesn't matter. If Donald Trump came to the hood and I see my buddy trying to jump, man, leave DT alone. It's the same way with anybody else. We gotta stop the violence. We we are the people are the ones that have the ability to either love or we have the ability to either hate. That's in us. We can't be looking outside to solve an internal problem. Do I want to be the next president that says, "Hey, I'm gonna change all these laws"? No, I'm not. I'm gonna get that table of brotherhood that Dr. King talked about in my beloved community, and I'm gonna bring the atheists, the Hindus. Every single body needs to come to that table. And then we discuss what's right for representation for all people. That's how you make America great. Not just one ideology, one concept. Because every candidate is talking about what they've experienced. Well, I've experienced a lot too in my little 47 years on life. My little younger brother committed suicide four years ago. He drove his car into a, a ditch because he had a, a lifestyle that wasn't pleasing. So he felt rejected by society. So he took his life. My other little brother, a year ago, Thanksgiving, he took his life. Opioid overdose. Then the shooting that happened in Aurora. Henry Pratt, y'all remember that shooting? Happened a year ago. So my friend was a shooter. So my friend from, child, from grade school was a shooter. 
Then there was another shooting that just happened over here in Wisconsin. People are t getting angry. And we're saying we're going to pass more gun laws. How about we just respect people? Because my friend Gary, I got his employee file. He wrote grievances for 12 years. Every one of those grievances kept getting rejected. Rejected. Do I agree with his decision? Hell no, I don't agree with his decision. But it puts a little more into the why things happen. The why. So if we look at the shooter and say he should have never did that, correct. But what made him do that? What makes somebody work at a place for 21 years, 20 years, the guy in Wisconsin, and shoot the people? And then you see he sued back in 1984 because he felt discriminated against. That means there's something wrong with the company's policy, which goes back to my initial point, respect matters. Respect matters. We should not still be fighting racism, discrimination. We sh that, like, that should have been done and over with. Back in the 60s, when they passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act bill, because what a lot of people don't know, I know about the abolitionists, Lloyd Garrison, the whites and civil rights. When my ancestors left from the Underground Railroad and they had the little lights in the homes up north, who was that? That was white people. So why would I keep racism up? Come on, Jesse Jackson, cut it out. Cut it out. Let's start loving each other. Let's start respecting our neighborhood. Our platform is on three points. Human rights, criminal justice reform, and economic development. The criminal justice system is a human right issue. Right now in Mississippi, what's going on down there, these people are getting killed in the prison, inhumane living conditions. What do I want to do? Abolish slavery. It's in the Constitution, the 14th Amendment. That's what we're supposed to do, eradicate poverty. Because once you eradicate poverty, crime goes down. The people, we, we, we have a, a, a blueprint for green collar jobs, which builds sustainable housing. So now your heating and air bill is only $500 a year. How about that? My friend Tom Decker, he says, I'm just a phone call, phone call away. He sprays foam in there, and that's how he does that. These are jobs we can create right now. And a lot of uh, uh, my black counterparts are talking about, well, we need jobs and justice, jobs and justice. I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with the 1921 Tulsa, Oklahoma, when they had Black Wall Street. They didn't get a bailout from the government to build up their community. If you say we built the country before, it's time to build again. And now we control the dollar that goes on into our community. We start building our own story. But it's like, it's like we, we want the government to give us a handout. Please give me something, and then I feel validated. No, how about I get up and do it myself? And what do I feel about education and why we should make education free? If you're not using your library card, you shouldn't get a free education. Ignorance is what the problem is. We're not reading. We want somebody to do something for us. You guys grew up with librarians. That's what we learned about what we want to do with our life. Not by somebody telling us, promise us some pie in the sky. All of these people that went to college, got all this college debt, they don't even have a job. But what they spent all this money for in college, and we still want free college? How many of y'all went to college and needed it? Did you need that college degree for what you were doing? Mm -hmm. And what about the trades? Do you need a college degree for trades? Because the trades is what we need to be building again. And now we're going to start building sustainable and affordable housing. That's what we need to be doing. Because when the 90s came out and they pushed this big thing on college, it seemed great in the beginning. But now we got all this college debt. This generation of millennials coming up saying, we don't want the debt. They'll never get out of debt. This is what we're doing to the generations coming on. As President of the United States, we know, I know how to balance a budget. Real easy. Don't spend what you don't have. It's real easy. But if I could just make money up out the thin air, call Treasury and the, uh, uh, the Department of Treasury and say, we need more money. No, you need to do right with what you have. Let's go back to the beginning and say, listen, there was a time when the, 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 the budget was balanced, and I want to say it was Andrew Jackson was the, the first one that had the, the budget balanced, if I'm correct. But it, it didn't start just with him. It was it, He was the president when he came in when it happened. So that's what I do. I look back in history and I say, okay, well this is what this president did, and this was that president did, and this would work. So then I try to implement what they did. I call that resurrecting the dream of those that went before me. And then I ask, who's my favorite president? 
Jimmy Carter. Look at him, 94 years old, still serving the people. See, if you want to be the president, you should be serving all people, not your party. Well, I represent the Democrats. I re represent the Republicans. What about representing the people? We elected you to be our representation, our public servant. That's what we need. And that's what Andy Williams Jr. will do as the President of the United States of America. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Come back to the community and serve my elders and serve this next generation and inspire them. I have a whole generation of people that said we've never voted before because they never had a right to, they never felt there was somebody that represented them to have a reason to vote. Now I step up on the scene. I'm ready to vote now, Andy. Because we've seen what you've been doing for the last 20 years, serving in your community. Well, my friend, that stuff happened at Henry Pratt, I still had to go to the police fundraiser because they're my friends too. It wasn't just, I just want to say, hey, I want to help his family out. But see, nobody else was standing up because he still had a mother and a sister. And you could just imagine, the mother didn't even want nobody to talk to her. I was the only one that got the newspaper to come over there and give a story. And she was ready, and then she backed out from it. And you can imagine why she's afraid. But I still went to the police fundraiser because they still my friends too. And you know what one of the officers said? He came up, he shook my head and said, that's noble what you did. I'm saying I don't want another mass shooting. That's a mental health issue. That's what we need to be getting to, the root cause of it. When somebody oppresses people for so long, sometimes they just snap. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room that's done got mad before. And we can say, I never would do that. I never would react that way. You probably won't because it's not been inside of you. But if it's been inside of you, you've been rejected your whole life, one day you rise up and say, I'm tired of being rejected. The first, it's not the first one, but the first one that's where they got the name from, 1986, that postal shooting. That's when we, we should have started looking at what happened back then. When I went to Henry Pratt four days after the shooting, lady there told me, CEOs from other companies calling over here telling us what to expect. Well, why they didn't write the manual? after they shooting happened, so we, we would never have to expect this to happen again. That's liberty. That's liberty. That's freedom. That's justice for all. That's what we want for our people. Not my people, all people. Because based on the Declaration of Independence, we all are born with unalienable rights. The government should not be oppressing them. We have freedom. And it's time this country operates on that freedom, the freedom of the founding fathers. Even George Washington, even with him having slaves, one of his slaves wind up doing a eulogy at his funeral. Why? George Washington said, man, maybe some things I did wrong. But if we don't know that in the history books, we're going to keep it, keep it going, keep it going, and say all the things that we don't know. The educational system needs a whole overhaul. Why? They're not teaching education totally. They're teaching indoctrination. It's one side of the story. What's my solution for that? Build charter schools in your own community. Because you can't just sit there and think we're going to change the education system overnight. But I definitely don't want my kids going back into the same system that's not teaching the truth. There's solutions, there's choices. And when we start making choices as, a, as humans, not as you know oppressed citizens, but as humans, and say, I'm responsible for my own choices. I'm responsible for my own decisions then we can make America great again. I could go on about all the stories and the platforms that I promised I'm going to do, but like I told you before, I can't do nothing other than the job description allows me to do as a president. There's only so many powers the president has. Without two-thirds of Congress, all y'all doing is lying to the people about stuff that you're not going to be able to do without Congress approving it. However, I got a plan. See, Jeff Bezos gave away $98 million for homeless. Now, if I talk to Jeff as president, I call him up and say, out of that $98 million you gave away for homeless, we could have built 90 vocational schools. And then we could have built our way out of homelessness. Because now you take the homeless people, teach them a trade and a skill, and now they're building their own sustainable and affordable housing. That's what we would do. The Koch Foundation, Charles, Charles Koch, it's the first time I saw a billionaire 
hiring felons and doesn't even put where you convicted a felony on the application. So as much as Bernie, and I respect Bernie, but you're talking about the Koch Foundation, they're implementing what you're running on. Do you see what I'm saying? You're saying, I'm going to do this when I become president. Well, Charles Koch is already doing it. He's already doing it. So that's why I'm not attacking the billionaires and all their money. If, I may, if, 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 the, if Charles made all his money off of oil and polluting the community, quote unquote, that's what they say, then as me, I'm an inventor, I, I have a patent, I'm going to invent something that's going to not pollute the company, I mean the, the, the environment that they're at. Because that's what we do with innovation. We invent stuff to make it work for all. Because he's in a generation that maybe doesn't invent nothing. Can you imagine having billions of dollars and somebody telling you, well, you should pay more. Uh, if you're making this much money, I want to tax you 52%. That's not equality for all. That's keeping the same system up. Well, you did this, or you made this, you should give this. How can somebody tell you what you should do with the money you made? How? Especially when they're already doing it. That's what we, to, to, to balance it out and believe in equality, Equality is for all people, not for who you dictate. Well, this person should pay this, or this person should get that. That's not equality. There's one constitution that works for everybody. That's how it is. Simple. We made this whole world and society so difficult by our own personal beliefs. My own personal beliefs does not dictate me to pass a law to oppress you. It doesn't. If you choose to make your own decisions, what am I going to do? As long as you're not hurting nobody, and as long as you're not stealing from nobody. So if I'm going to pass a law, I don't need to. Theft is already a crime. So all them Bank of, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Bank of New York Mellon, Lehman Brothers, all that money, that's a racketeering, that's a criminal enterprise. The same way you come into the community, take the, 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 the properties and the stuff that the drug dealers when they accumulate their cars and all that, that's the same thing we should be doing with the, the Lehman Brothers and, and that money. However, because I don't believe in repaying evil for evil, I give them an opportunity under the Community Reinvestment Act to reinvest in the community they destroyed. So that's fair, right? That happened so long ago. Well, why don't we reinvest based on the Community Reinvestment Act and build sustainable housing in Baltimore, in the south side of Chicago, in Compton. In fact, the mayor in Compton right now is doing great economic development. Right now, this is what she's doing. She just got reelected, 31 years old. The mayor out of Atlanta raised $50 million for uh, homeless. There wasn't no vote for that. They're already in office doing it. There's nothing new we need to create. There's blueprints for everything that we need to do in this society. It's time for us to stop talking about it and be about it. We spend so much time talking and voting, we're not taking action. Our campaign is about action. Action Jackson, that's not me, Action Jackson. It's time to take action and get it done. And that's why I say, our platform for building sustainable housing, it doesn't matter if I'm the president or not, because we're doing it now. We found a building, $5 million building in Aurora. We're working on getting it right now. Because why would I wait if I see the vision what needs to be done, we need to do it now. Then we're going to reduce uh, 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 homelessness. Then we're going to reduce that recidivism rate. Because you're giving people opportunities to discover that they were created for more than just committing crimes. Created for more than just harming your neighbor. I mean, I'm sure you don't want to know what they quote unquote call a thug living in your neighborhood trying to rob you. But if he got a job and he comes cut your grass, say, hey, how you doing? Now you got respect. Because see, I grew up cutting grass, delivering papers, shoveling snow. That's, that's, that's what I grew up in. My, my kids, don't, they, they don't know nothing about that. They just, they just talk to me. It's, it's different. <laughs> Somebody's always creating opportunities, and then when we don't like the opportunity they created because we see them successful, we want to come in and don't try to take it from them. That's what the government has been doing. And again, I'm not blaming the government. I'm saying we all hold culpability in what is happening in our society. It's left, up, it's left up to us to be the change. It's left up to us to be the solution. There's no way I would walk into the President uh, 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 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and not reach out to somebody in this room to ask for advice, even if it's Justin. Justin, my buddy over there. 
because I know I can't do this by myself. With the chief citizen of all is just a face. He's just a face. But if you see, there are certain things you can do, which is pardoning, which I would pardon several people in the federal prison, but not until I did an assessment to make sure that their mindset is right. Because sometimes you're in jail and you sit there for years and all you're thinking is plotting revenge, revenge, revenge. I got to get, no, you can't. We got to stop that. Because just letting everybody out is not the solution, but making sure people, what, the, what, what it was called the Department of Corrections, to rehabilitate people. That's what it was meant to do. And that's what we need to do as a society, to help people discover their purpose, find their way, so we can live happily ever after. That's what we was created to do, to live happy. Not to live in fear, not to live worried. I mean, you guys, I grew up when I didn't have to lock the doors at the house until somebody stole my dad's tools. There's a time when we did not have to worry about it, whether it was the Mayberry, that's what they call it. Leave it to Beaver, those type of shows. The Andy Griffin show. They used to call me Andy Griffin. Hey, Andy Griffin. We can have that again if we want it. It's going to take some time. And it's going to take some work. And it's going to take about seven years. That's why I need y'all voting. Because I got to get past the first four. And then that second half, we're going to smooth sail. And you know what? I'll be the presidential candidate that'll come right back here to the College of Complexes and speak to y'all. Because if you give me an opportunity now, I'll come back again. Because I want that same opportunity to address you the same way, to find out what you need right now, and then we'll take care of it. We won't wait and say, well, I got to wait till Congress it. No, what you need? You need me to come cut your grass? Fine. You need me to get a couple of my friends? We'll come over there and paint. Because Jimmy Carter's doing it, so that's my example. That's my model president. So then that's what I can do. I'm not going to keep y'all a whole hour. Because like I said, I ain't got a lot of promises. I got work to do. Thank you. Right. Yes. Okay. I, I think you said that uh, Bezos donated $100,000 for the homeless people or something. Like $98 million. Well, that's what the news said. No, that's what I meant, 98, I'm 98 million. I meant $98 million. Okay, so let's say Jeff Bezos has ten billion dollars. That ninety-eight million is one tenth of one billion. What about the other nine billion? How did he get that money? And who, who were the people who worked to create that wealth? He so didn't work to create the wealth. Co correct. So I don't know how Jeff Bezos got the money because I don't know him personally. But I will say, he built Amazon. And then the consumer started buying from Amazon. So when the consumer started buying it, he saw an opportunity, he made it convenient, and it helped him in cr create his wealth. Who works at Amazon? Yeah, how much? He didn't do it himself. He Correct. The, not, he didn't deliver one package. He did not. He had a vision. No, he She's asking, he what about people those that people? Were, you talking about the people that works for him? Yeah. 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 And, 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 the, uh, and the Wall Street, where there were the wealth was created by the work of people who uh, are not wealthy. They're working, and they're talking about that. taking advantage of. So what I would say is, once we in our community start bringing back the mom and pa shop and having the, get rid of the, the bureaucracy and teaching entrepreneurship, then we don't go to people like Jeff Bezos to build up his, his vision and his idea. But he has the ability, just like any one of us, has the same ability to come up with an idea and go for it. That's what we do. And so I can't get mad at Jeff Bezos because he came up with an idea and he went for it. And people said, well, I need jobs. So he said, well, I'm going to pay you $13,000 an hour. And we said, okay, well, I'm going to take it. I can't tell Jeff, well, you wrong for paying him $13,000 an hour. What I can say is let's find these people in here to teach them entrepreneurship, to find out if they had a dream or if they had an idea, and then help them create that opportunity for themselves. Give them the tools and resources to become the next Jeff Bezos. Yes. <laughs> but we can't all be Jeff Bezos. If we believe we all can't be Jeff we, Bezos, we, we can't. can't. There's well, not everybody can one? be the billionaire. I, I agree. We don't all need to be I Jeff Bezos. Who wants to be with Charlie back there? But what we have is an opportunity to, to do what we feel we want to do. So if, if 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 I feel me as Andy Williams Jr. I feel I want to run for president, I would have uh, several people. You can't do that. Why can't I? 
I, I can do it. I mean, I'm what? I was born in the United States. I'm 35 years old. I've been here 14 years. That's the only reason why I wouldn't run for president is if I listen to what somebody else said. And me, if I get, not if, when I get the billions of dollars, I'm going to do exactly what I want to do with the money. And that's going to come back and help the people. That's what I'm going to do. But, okay, so not all of us, some of us, you know, we can't all, you know, all the wealth, I think people, their needs aren't met. I agree. And that, you know, like I agree with you, prison reform and, but that's the basic problem. Well, yeah, and there are Correct. people at the top that take advantage of the people at the bottom. And that's, that's it's just people at the top, the ones with a great fortune, there's always a great crime behind it. They're so, the ones that are exploiting people. Right. Well, what I would say is I never want to address that situation about what I believe people at the top are doing because all the top 10 male and top 10 female billionaires, with the exception of Mars, all have foundations. The Walmart Foundation sets up charter schools. You can apply to them to get money to do stuff in the disenfranchised community. So if the people don't know that opportunity exists, then how would they apply for it? So if enough people applied for it, and then they rejected it. So I can never say what they won't do until I apply and get rejected. If I've never been rejected, I don't want to say what they won't do. I can't give, I, that would not be fair. This is my um, favorite hat guy. Yeah, John. <laughs> John. <laughs> Well, first, I think you just described an oligarchy where the only thing we ever get is where the people who've stolen all of our money because of their influence in the government are going to give us back a pittance of what they stole and then have flag wavers running around saying, look what we're doing, whereas instead of the people themselves taxing themselves and having a government that is of and for and by the people, Correct. which is not them and us. The minute you say them and us, them, government, Correct. you're you're clouding the waters, Correct. I believe that. Secondly, uh, there's so much you said there that, uh, like, the budget, you would say, there is no such thing as a budget. We have a printing press. You're it's right. called the Treasury. Correct. And then when 2008 and nine, Obama printed $21 trillion. Correct. You didn't see a 1% increase in, in inflation, did you? Nope. No nope. problem with money. Problem is how it's being used. Yes. Correct. And the last thing I don't want to take things up, but in, there's two times America was like Denmark, which is now the country in the world, twice. 1832, where the difference in the highest and lowest was almost four times, four times, and in after Roosevelt started the New Deal. Then again, those, those are the most intent okay. times in the history of America where Americans actually yeah, believe this was a Do you world. have a question? Oh, yeah. it's a comment. Well, it's, no, wait, we need this as a question, period. Oh, sorry. To get a chance to rebut at the end well, of the question. Maybe I was wrong. That's a question. Do you believe that? <laughs> I, I, I do believe that if Denmark is the example, then as leader of the free world, I call Denmark and say, how can I do what you're doing over here in the United States? Because I don't look to try to recreate something new that's already existing. I learn from those that have already doing it. That's what I would do for you. Uh, for uh, no, wait, it's one. one go ahead. I got it, right? No, no, Kip. right behind you. Ladies first. Ladies. Oh, okay, go ahead. She, she had a hand down. Loud. First of all, thank you so much for your speech. You're very fair. It's very clear. Today, I think it's very, very good. So, uh, what I tried to ask you, um, in California, recently, I heard from the news, they really, really, really helping homeless people in California. I don't know if you want to take it around. It's not PM, you know, or it's not 78. Uh, yeah. so, anyway, so I like what they say because they they say pretty big number of homeless people in California that go together and they try to really really quick to help build even temporary houses, transitional houses or whatever. Not shelters, but houses, maybe small and What's so your question? question? Yeah, my question. Yes. Yeah, my everybody qu has a question okay, tonight. My qu okay, my question to you. Like represent some some representative. Can we do something about it in really, really helping homeless here who comprehended not crazy, you know? But people who really homeless who lost job, who don't have income. Can you try to help and focusing on this issue and helping somehow with proposals? 
So what, what I do is this. Whenever I see something that was already working, a blueprint. So if you're saying in California, this is what they're doing to eradicate homelessness. Because I like abolishing and eradicating. Those are the words that I like so it's done with, it's no more. If that blueprint has worked in any part of America, then we look to say, let's make this a national model, but it, it needs to be tweaked on the demographics of where it's being put at. So yes, that's exactly what I would do. And that's why I talked about the lady, uh, the mayor in Atlanta, how she raised $50 million for homeless. Now, I don't know what she did with the money because I didn't go further into that. But if that was a solution, then that's the solution that I would look to say, let's take it national. Well, Kim, Kim Fox says she's not going to prosecute any cases under a theft of $1,000 because she doesn't want to give records to these young people. But if they do the crime, they should do the time, like what you call it said. I mean, uh, that's how I feel about it. Well, how do you feel about it? So I don't know exactly what her position was in to say that because it might be some more stuff that she's talking about. But if there's a theft under $1,000, let's say that that's what it is. I want to get to the root cause of why the theft happened. So there's got to be some accountability. Now, what I say prosecuting, I don't know the scenario of that. But if I get to, to why you did it, hold you accountable, whether that's community service, whether that's uh, um, something to hold you accountable, but then to make sure you get a balance which says, listen, you're going to have to pay this money back. You stole it from this person. You're going to pay it back. You're going to do community service. And then we're going to get you in this vocational school. Then we're going to get you in this art school. We're going to get you into something so then you can become self-sufficient. Because just punishing you without bringing you another option is going to say, well, I'm going to get out of jail. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. I need to get to the root of it. And the root of it is ignorance. Ignorance. That's what it comes from. We don't know. So I feel like... Again, I don't know her stance on where she's coming from that at, but if she's just saying there's no accountability, then there's something wrong with her saying that. And as president, I'm like, Kim, come up here, let me talk to you. That doesn't make sense what you're saying. Because if they rob you, what you going to do? Well, it was only $1,000. Well, hell, give everybody $1,000, then we won't rob you. So that's how I feel about that. Charlie. Yeah, Andy, um, he said here, the government keeps us oppressed. <coughs> Meg tells us uh, when we're going to sleep, and, and, and when we're going to eat. And I'm not aware of any legislation at he the federal, yes. state, or yes. local level that determines that. And I, one thing I do know is that the employers with $50 million are the ones who in fact dictate that. So why do you like the guys who oppress us? Does that make us, certainly the employer, the owner of the company, says when you're going to sleep and get up, and he tells What's you when you're going to have lunch. What's your question, <laughs> Charlie? That was, question. that was a question. You're saying, why do I like the guys that yeah, oppress you're us? you're blaming the government. The government um, doesn't do either of those. No. Well, the government does have culpability in what is happening. Is there a law one that says time, when, you eat, when you sleep? So here's, here's what I'm going to say to, to no, that No, it doesn't. Phrase. One full... Wait, if you know the answer, Charlie, why are you asking me? <laughs> because you're, you're giving... I'm just saying, Charlie, you leading, know the answer. It's called a leading question. I object. All right. Overruled. Well, tell me the law Sustained. that says I would not have to get up. I don't mean it literally, Charlie, but what I will well, say is this. If you, if, you park, if you park your car on the street of Chicago without a sticker, and you parked over there longer than two hours, I bet you're going to get up or they're going to tow your car. If you put your car out there without a sticker long enough, you're going to get a boot on that car. You telling me that's not oppression? You telling me that's not a bureaucracy? Why do I have to pay on the land that's free? Why do I have to pay on the land that's free? Why do I have to get my SNAP benefits taken away from me without understanding why I need the SNAP benefits in the first place? Nothing you say should be taken literally. Hey, that's your choice, Bernie. Say whatever you want. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Nothing is, I think it seems literal. Yes. Uh, you know, you mentioned that you mentioned that uh, in Tulsa, in, in Tulsa, they uh, developed their own Wall Street, their own. And and I was wondering if you would elaborate on that because I don't know that history. And the second thing uh, is the the massacre in Tulsa. Uh, I think it was about 1921, yes, I, yes. and I wonder if uh, it was related to the fact that in Tulsa, the people had their own um, 
wealth creation methods. So you literally answered your question. No, I, didn't. I, I mean, I don't know the history. Well, I, I'm telling you, they created their own wealth. They had a street, green, green, green leaf street or something, all black businesses. They had their own doctors, lawyers, grocery stores, own taxi company, own schools. Somehow somebody said, uh, somebody whistled at a woman or tried to do something, uh, and they arrested him. Fifteen black people went down to the courthouse with guns, trying to make sure the guy got out, um, and he was not, you know, killed, basically. And then what happened is thousand, about a thousand uh, white, angry mob people came over to Greenleaf, which was Tulsa, Oklahoma, in that area, and killed the people in the neighborhood, burnt down their houses, and they've never rebuilt back again. And that, and that destroyed the wealth, uh, the, what you were talking about, the wealth creation that existed in Tulsa before the massacre. It, it destroyed it, but it, it destroyed more than that. It destroyed their morals. So if I built all this and then now it's taken away, I'm, again, that's 1920, and it goes from generation to generation. My, I'm afraid to do that again because this is what has happened to me. And then again, there's no accountability from that. So I feel that the people are mentally in their mind oppressed, so they're afraid to do that again. That's why we keep asking the government to do something for us. So that's, are you familiar with the bombing on Wall Street? Which one was that? No. 1921, I think it was. I'm familiar with it now. You told me. Please elaborate and make sure it's a question. No, I'll, I'll, I'll explain <laughs> later. Okay. The bombing of Wall Street? There was a bombing on Wall Street. It was yes, a terrorist so attack in 1921. Oh, in front of the J.P. Morgan Bank. Yeah, the J.P. Oh. Morgan Bank. Then they went after every immigrant in the country. Yeah. yeah. But that was true. So this was a question. Yes, All right, let's go. Andy, I, I've heard Louder. you speak before. Andy, I've heard you speak before, and I appreciate that you, generally speaking, try to go positive. Uh, but you were pretty easy on uh, President Trump in a lot of ways. Uh, why would someone want to take a risk um, on you? And if I could group one or two other questions with that. You're from the Aurora area, A -town. and politicians in that area uh, that you've worked with in your community activist work, that, that you've had a good experience with, and then other politicians, state, local, and federal, you need to get rid of. So the president, and then your uh, naughty and nice list, please. The question why someone should pick you and not the president? President Trump, why did you pick me? Yeah. Because <laughs> they, they, they want freedom. And they want somebody that's going to respect all people and not just a little party. See, I'm no puppet. I'm not going to be out here trying to represent just one party and keep one and, and look out for my homies without realizing everybody are humans. So that's one. And number two, if, if I'm correct about Aurora, because um, I'm not clear on the question, but I, I'll say this. I love Aurora, but there's a set of accountability in Aurora. I got stopped by the police. August 27th in a racial profiling case. I represent myself in pretty much all my legal cases. That's what I've done because I do my research. They, I knew how to get subpoenas, ask for a certain discovery. I'm no longer fighting the prosecutor in the stupid traffic ticket. I'm fighting the city's attorney. As soon as I get the information, I'm bringing a lawsuit against the city because it's accountability. And the, the purpose of the stop was I ran a stop sign and didn't use my turn signal 100 feet. That was a lie. Because I know where to see the police at, and they just saw me riding by in quote unquote a gang neighborhood, a black kid, they drove behind me for three blocks, ran the place on the car I was in, which is my wife's car, it's Puerto Rican, Bonita Cruz, in a community, black guy, they racial profiled me, so it's accountability. And I did text the mayor, because I worked for his law firm, said, hey, Rich, this guy stayed in my car for 25 minutes, let's do dialogue. He said, no, that's fine with me. Come March, they'll see the lawsuit. Accountability is what I call it. Cool. I'd like to know where Wayne and Garth come into all this. Uh, who is that? The Garth Brooks? No, no, from, from uh, the Aurora podcast on Saturday Night Live. Wayne, Wayne's World. Wayne's World. <laughs> I was in eighth grade at Walden when Wayne's World came around there. I don't know. I was hoping they was coming by the school, but they, they did. <laughs> Wayne's World. Yes, sir, Mr. Charlie. Yeah, you say you're... Uh... Uh, 
I'm a little curious. You, you profess to be, want to be the chief citizen uh, of the United States. And talk to me, and you talk to a lot of about neighborhoods and so forth. But I'm a little curious why you like a flat tax. And one person has a home worth $50 million, and his neighbors are homeless. What's the question? Why does he like a flat tax? Why do you like, why do you have a neighborhood or one person that has a $50 million home and other people are homeless? So if the, if the $50 million home, the taxes based on the assessment for that, that property is, let's say $10,000, the flat tax is $1,000. That's 10%. If the other person has a, a home that's $20,000 and it's 10%, then his tax is $200. It's a flat tax. It's real simple. Flat taxes on income, flat taxes on property taxes, everything. But see, there's more into that is to say, I can eliminate the tax for certain wealth brackets if you invest so much back into charity. So if you give it back to charity, then there's a way to reduce that, and that's kind of like based on the opportunity zone. I don't 100% agree with the opportunity zone's model, but I agree with it enough to say with a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of adjustment, then everybody can say, you know what, I may not agree 100%, but I can live with it. It's better than what I had before. There's a flat tax, there's no incentive to invest in anything. It is when we invest in our local community and we don't do the bailout for Wall Street, but we do a bailout on Main Street. That's a very good incentive to teach entrepreneurs and economic development from a community level. Yes. Th there's a, there's you say we should have a flat tax, but then you will reduce it if you're uh, donating to the right places. With a flat tax, there is no reducing. Every one place pays a flat amount. Correct. Whether you donate to the correct area or not. What's your question? With a flat tax, there is no... <laughs> Yeah. Right. Deductions. Yeah. But that's, that's right. a rebuttal. That's not a question. Yeah, well. Yes, there is a question because he was. What's the question? There, there, Why is he like a there are no uh, really good Democratic if candidates you can right do now. That, and the, the, the number one, yeah. the one, yes, number one is Bernie Sanders. Well, He's ahead in all the polls. But I read that 67% think that. Uh, uh, Trump will beat Bernie Sanders in, 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 in a, a presidential, and uh, uh, it looks like the Republicans, well, what do you think about that? The, the Republicans are going to get in again because the God. Democrats don't have anybody outstanding. And nobody knows about you, really. Not yet. They will. Okay. Not yet. And you know what? It's, it's at least 15 people that know about me now that didn't know about me about an hour ago, right? You're pretty so, good. Pretty good. So we keep moving. We keep moving. And what I do have is no other candidate has is experience. That's what I do have. Because I got a track record of not being a politician but being a human that believes in administering justice for all. That's what I do have. And the second thing is, because I'm from the hip hop community, that generation, we have a whole bunch of hip hop songs coming out. And then what we believe is Dr. King's daughter, Bernice King, she'll endorse because I'm only resurrecting the plan of her father, my beloved community. Instead of me saying, I have a dream, I am the dream. See, my father married a white woman. I am the dream. See, my little brother, his kids are black, white, and Latino. I am the dream. See, my wife, she Puerto Rican. See, I am the dream. So when we go together for family gatherings, that's the table of brotherhood. So in, a, in enough time, as the universe begins to open up, the world will see there's a candidate that's coming from the Libertarian Party that has one message, freedom, liberty, and justice for all. How are you going to stop all the murders in Chicago? Economic development. And I won't say I can stop all the murders. What I can do say is I can reduce them because it's a time. It, it, like it's a process. It's a process. But if we get enough people on board back in the 60s, holding these little knuckleheads accountable, snatching them up by their pants, pull up your pants, little boy, but then hugging them at the same time. Because, see, what we don't need is another bunch of rules. What we need is a little bit of love. See, war is not the answer. Love can only conquer hate. So in order to conquer the hate, we got to give love, and that's what we are missing. Love, we not, we don't have respect. So can I say we'll solve it? Well, let's look at L.A. They reduced their gun violence. What did they do? Economic development. 
That's what we need in Chicago, economic development. If you're closing down the schools, where are the kids going to do? They're only going to emulate what they see in their neighborhood. So if I bring in a vocational school, help you discover you have a gift, little dude. And because I'm from the streets, a gang member, I used to be a gang leader. They looking at me saying, dang, if you did it, then I can do it. Right, but I can only do it if you stop killing each other right now. Because I cannot afford you to kill any one of these elders in here, my granddaughter, my neighbor, the, the person I don't know. Because if you do, you're going to go to prison. Now, I know right now you don't care about that because this generation is coming up without hope. So then I show up to be their hope. To say, if I could change, if I can do it, man, you you going to do it because I'm going to make sure you got the tools and resources to do it. So that's how. All right. I have a question. You sure? Uh, yep. Uh, would it be true to say that 80% of your enthusiasm is due to your good wife? No, that would be not true. Uh, it would be 100%. <laughs> it would be 100%. And I will say this, when I felt led to, to run for president, which, um, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, it talks about God and a creator. I have that same God, I have that same creator. And when I, God said, hey son, would you run for president? I said, yes, can I ask my wife? She prayed about it when she said yes. Her last name is Cruz. I said, I can't lose with Benita Cruz. Because see, when the wife rocks with you, you can't lose. You can't lose. I agree with you. Don't. Yes, Charlie. Yeah, you said here, uh, Andy, we only hear what the media tells us, so. I, I, I don't fully understand that. Are you saying we shouldn't read newspapers or watch the news or what? No, I believe you should read the newspapers and I believe you should, should watch the news. But what I am telling you, dig a little deeper. Because there's two sides to every story, that's all I'm saying. Because I believe with Donald Trump, I believe in the fact when he says fake news, I'm just saying it's biased news. Because if all I ever see is black people shooting black people, or cops shooting black people, but then I never see the cop that shot the man in his door in Virginia that was a white cop that shot a white man. If I never see that, then the images in my mind said, well, it's just black on black crime. It's, no, police is killing everybody. And I don't want to say police. There's certain officers that do that. There's certain right. officers. Because it's not the problem with the police yeah. department. The problem is we're not holding people accountable. So I believe in reading the news and I'm a historian. I love reading and research. I love it because once I read it or, or watch it or A&E, I get to see another side of the story that I didn't know existed. Now, I'm not saying the other side of the story is right, but by hearing both sides of the story, I get to make an intelligent decision for myself. So you want them to report white crime? No, I don't want them to report crime. I want them to report the good news. Okay. No, reporting crime is not the solution. The solution is reducing crime. That's right. That's what the solution is, not reporting. See, we keep up this bull crap. That's not the word I wanted to say, but there was no tagline. We keep up the bull crap. We got to stop it. We got to stop it. There's a lot more good news out here than it is bad news. Okay. I've got a question. I know you're from the Aurora area. Yes. Have you ever taken a visit to Fermi Lab, the National Atomic Accelerator Laboratory? I have not, but I do know about Fermi Lab, and one of my friends, a few of my friends, worked at Fermi Lab, but I have not been to Fermi Lab. Uh huh. Do you know about its significance and, and where it's been at with that area and its scientific? It's been a lot of an incubator of innovation for a lot of businesses out there too. Yes, I do. I know a friend that she just started working there about eight years. Fermi Lab has been a uh, national innovator when it comes to a lot of research and stuff that mm -hmm. they've done. So I do. That's that's a plus for my little hometown area. I know yes. they've done a lot of medical research there with their use of X-rays and some of the other pioneering cancer techniques too. Right, right. You should you should go take a, li a visit there. I've been there about nine times myself. Ten times is ten. Number ten is a good number. So when you come, call me up. We'll go together. Uh, I, <laughs> if you're serious, I will. One hundred percent, I'm serious. I'm true to whatever I say. Okay, you, consider You said you were from the streets. Okay, so uh, do, what do you think you should do when a, some guy is robbing you? Resist? I mean, do what? Just what? So, because I'm not faced with that situation, I can't say what I would do. Because it depends if I was faced with that situation, how I would handle it. It just depends. Because if it's a little homeless guy trying to rob me with a little stick, I might just give him the twenty dollars. 
or whatever he's asking for. If it's somebody with a gun trying to rob me, again, I don't know how I would react in that situation because I'm not in that situation. So I, I don't know. But I would hope wouldn't nobody rob me because I feel like I have enough good energy coming off that you should just ask me if you want something. You ain't got to take nothing from me. We both, we both broke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if we're done with if we're done with questions, can we go to rebuttals? Well, we also got a lot of people. I'm sure who are a lot of opinionated here. All right. Well, let's get one more. Let's get with your uh, excessive bloviation then, and we'll be done with it. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I have a question. Come on, Mr. Charlie. All right, you, you said here at one point, Andy, that something about rights given to us by the Creator. Yes, sir. I, wait a minute. I didn't, oh, oh. where'd you get that list? Well, but it's real good. <laughs> Glad you asked. Here it says right here. Um, <laughs> When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitles them. Wait, did I say that right? And of nature's God entitles them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which give them to the separation. That is in the Declaration of Independence in Congress, July 4, 1776. That's where I got it from. My job description, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence. Real easy. That's why I can't promise nothing that's not outside in my job description. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's go ahead. No camera, no camera. Okay. Go ahead. You said it was the 14th Amendment? I believe 14th, 13th, or 14th. It's the 13th. 13th Amendment, thank you. And it also says in there that uh, slavery is okay for prisoners. Would you try to change that to get the prisoner to get out of there? 100. Slavery is never okay. It's in the Constitution. That's what needs to be. That, that's what needs to be repealed, amended. Because you can do constitutional amendments. So those are the things that I look. And I would, I would, I would challenge anyone in Congress to challenge me to say that slavery is legal. And if they do challenge me, it's okay. Because every two years there's an election in the House of Congress. So the next two years, see you later, alligator. You gotta go. Say what? Minimum wage is okay, though. I never said minimum wage was okay. I believe in supporting a decent living that can support a family. That's what I believe in. How much would that be? So if we create sustainable housing and we stop jacking the prices up on cars and doing the other things, then maybe uh, $15 an hour could be sustainable. I, I'm not sure because it's a whole overall. But if we were to look at what uh, minimum wage should be based on inflation, it should be about $33 an hour if minimum wage would have kept up with inflation. That's right. So that's how I would do it. So that's what you stand for. No, I don't stand for I just stand for, I stand for equity, freedom, liberty, and justice for all. Now how we get there, I'm not back there yet to say that. I have my own ideas and okay. concepts of what I believe we can do to get there. Andy, if I need $33 an hour to fulfill the American I have one more. more. not in favor of my by sharing in the American dream. Go out and start a because, business and earn it. Be, because if, if, if you need $33 an hour to support the American dream, then there's millions of other people that need $33, $33 an hour to support the American yeah. dream. And then if we're not in the position to build the grocery stores and the cars, then the cars are going to say, well, we need more money too. So now the cars that are 20000 go up to 30000 and we're back into the same crazy right. cycle we started at before we even got there. So I believe it needs to be a full overhaul. If the Model T, when I was born in 1972, you could buy a brand new car for $3,000. What happened? How was that same car now $25,000? Considering you got robots making the cars. Somebody inflated those prices. What I'm saying is we need to resurrect the auto industry and start making stuff simple again. All this technology and all that stuff, it hurts us. It doesn't help us. Somebody's making billions of dollars and it's not us. So in order... It's a <laughs> so my request, my request 
My request for a pay raise is denied in the back to seven and a quarter. You no, know, you're, you're, is that, am I correct? You, you know what, if you needed a pay raise, then I'd give you a pay raise. But you just pull up my chain, because you're retired, you don't need no pay raise. So bring it to me, that real story that really needs a pay raise, and we'll see what we can do to help them. Thank you. One minute, I have a real question. You always have real questions. Yes. No, I had a comment before. All right, let's get it. May I? Yes, please. All right. <clears throat> Tell me what you think the difference is between the slavery we traditionally think of in the South and the slavery that exists today. It's wage slavery. Anybody has to work in order to get money. Where did that ever come from? So I don't think it's any different. I think it's exactly the same. Um, if you go to the prison industrial complex, they're making anywhere between 30 cents to $3 an hour. In and that's fact, a gift. Uh, mm -hmm. Correct. In fact, the Smith Barney, MasterCard, Visa, uh, Vanguard, the prisons are on the stock market. So if you have prisons on the stock market, that means there's a commodity. In order to get the commodity, you got to pass laws. So the laws get you the people to come into the jails. So, so that's the problem. So what I, again, abolishing slavery, that's in the Constitution. But the way we, get, we, we would reduce that is there's no more private prisons. Because I believe in intervention, no, I believe in prevention, intervention, and redemption. That's what I believe. Excuse me, you misunderstood my question. I agree with everything you said. Okay. The question was, what's different about slavery in the South than all the slavery we've all encountered in our lives when we go to work? Because work is no different. I got you. I got you. The There's only difference is, is the slavery when we go to work, we get paid a little bit more. But so it's the we're same still slavery. Yeah. We're all what? slaves. We're all oppressed to the same system. Exactly. And the oppressors are the bees maybe? No, no. The oppressors is a balance between both of us because we continue to vote the people in to keep us oppressed. So there's not, I can't point the finger at no one individual without pointing the finger at me first, which is why I'm running for President of the United States. Because once I see Andy, you can be the change. You can't blame nobody else. If you allow this to keep happening, you got to rise up. So I'm telling you, it's 468 seats that's up for election. That's right. Come on, join the Libertarian Party with us. And run for office. Can't you can keep the hat. You can keep the hat. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, I think now it's kind of starting to get repetitive with the yeah, questions. Let's go. let's go to rebuttals. How many right. have a rebuttal to speak tonight? Can you hold your hands up high? I think we'll go at about five minutes of these. Let's get started and uh, let's get up there and get started on the rebuttals. Let's thank our speaker. Let's thank our speaker. Each of you get five minutes on a clock. Will somebody please keep time? Okay. So go ahead and let's get started on the rebuttals. Five minutes. Yes. Yeah, you, can, uh, you, sit yeah, yeah. you sit down and you listen. Now it's your turn to have dinner and compose your speaker's final word. You listen. You listen now. I was really uh, I like I like Andy's um, energy and positivity, and uh, it made for a very uh, interesting discussion tonight. Um, uh, I, uh, I I missed announcements, but I wanted to thank everybody for reaching out to me and saying hey, and so giving you know, giving me support or whatever over the past couple weeks. Thank you. Um, I'm really tired right now and I have hiccups, so that's pretty much all I have to say. But Andy, very good job tonight. Uh, I can't wait for Tuesday. Uh, and, um, yeah. Thank you. Today, let's thank everybody. got it, I was challenged a while back by the speaker, although perhaps he didn't attend that. When he asked, well, what college, what good did college do you? College did me a great deal of good, regardless of what kind of job I had. It made me a better educated and more well-rounded person, much more exposed to a world of differing ideas. It taught me how to work 
and live with people from different backgrounds other than myself, other than my own background. So college did me a great deal of good. And I think it does, does lots of people good to go to college. And it isn't only about preparing you for a job. It's part of it, but it's not all of it. Thank you. Well said. Yeah, boy, well said. I'll give you. <laughs> I gotta tell you, you and your wife make a wonderful cup. I have a light here. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh -oh. right but, uh -oh. you're right to but. We all have one. Some trouble to be. I just made a few notes. You were talking about, for instance, uh, taxes. Taxes is the kind of cost of living in society. And you always graduate taxes. In any society that's successful, there's no such thing as a flat tax. Because a flat tax on a person making $1,000 is 10% of their income, which they don't even have enough to live on to be given. Or you eliminate up to $20,000. It's never going to work. What I think you've been talking about as we're a box called America, USA, not America, USA. And in that box, we're going to all try and fix the problems. Or the fact, the problem is the box. <laughs> I mean, the problem is the box. We're all in it. We don't seem to even, it's like a, a tiger in a cage. Is that a tiger really? That tiger that was born in that zoo and lived in that zoo and dies in that zoo? And you go and it looks like a tiger. You and I look like normal human beings or normally abnormal human beings because of our circumstances we've created. And your speech was how somehow to tweak the system to try to get around it. The system's a problem. All the things you talked about are things and ways to play with it, make it a little bit better, maybe, for some people, not for everybody. And what I was beginning to say was a comment, was in 1832 and in 1932, amazing, 100 years exactly, those were the two great times in America when people most people made, you know, the difference in money was very low, and it was the highest satisfaction rate of the citizens of the United States. We're again at the super low because of the Jeff Bezos and people who have accumulated so much. And nobody says they should take it away. My only comment would be just start the taxes now. Make every corporation put 10% of their stock into a normal fund that the United States runs. And every time they have an increase, every time they give a dividend, that 10% goes to the citizens of the United States and is distributed by Alaska, does oil things. Because now you, you've got, we're all in it together. You can't run a company, you can't be a libertarian in the sense of, like this company stands alone. You need a whole society to support it. And if you don't see that, you know, I think you're missing the picture. And I wasn't sure whether you did or not. You sound like you do, but you said libertarian. That's kind of really hard there, but that's, uh, I'm not so sure exactly where you are, but I think your heart's in the right place. And if we only had about 10,000 of you in every little city in America, we don't need a president. That's true. But thank you. Thank you. Next. Next rebutter. Did I Come on, there's an open mic. Oh, everybody else wanted to get up there. Why don't you go ahead? I did. I did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is. go first. Which one do I say? This one. Please, and thank you. Well, thank you again, Andy. Um, no great uh, overarching insight. Uh, at least a couple to put out there. Uh, I would, kind of like the question I asked earlier, I would, this is a piece of your campaign approach, I want you to especially because you're running for president here, a sort of sharper vision of uh, what attacks you would want to make on President Trump, 
things about his politics and about his policies that you would find disagreeable. And likewise for whomever ends up leading the Democratic ticket. Most likely Bernie Sanders, but one never knows. Um, chances are Bernie Sanders. Um, and that you would have to be ready to be, because if it, I think your campaign would find it very difficult with a sort of um, all positive all the time, no, I got, just I as got a matter of messaging uh, to, to look into. Um, because I'm an officer with the local chapter of the party, I won't be picking explicit favorites for uh, for the presidential contenders, so I'll, I'll trip, I have to sidestep that somewhat. Um, we brought up earlier, I, I can't remember if it was you or someone during question and answer talked about the, uh, this was a contradiction I wanted to look at, the amount of money that we created or printed with the Treasury Department and with the bailouts, which I wanted to emphasize were wrapping around both George W. Bush and the Obama administration, right at the, those months of election and transition. Um, but how that didn't lead to, it was a rapid expansion in the money supply, but it didn't lead to the explosion in uh, consumer prices. Uh, but we've also wondered, well, where did all, of, did all this money that accrued to the billionaire class? Yeah, when you have the government printing an enormous amount of money that doesn't circulate and the excel, uh, velocity of money doesn't increase, instead of seeing inflation in the form of oh my god, every time I go to the grocery store is 3% higher. You see inflation in the sense of, well, the people who know how to game the investment system and the banking system accrued all the, or overwhelmingly accrued most of that freshly printed money. So it went directly from the you know proverbial printing press to the most powerful. Anyway, I know other people are in theory in line, so if there's more time left over, we can all talk to each other more later. Thank you. Thank you. Next. I have said this many a time here already, and that is I think we're still living in one of the most prosperous and golden ages of human society. We've seen life expectancy grow. We've seen a general increase in the, our general decrease in the level of poverty worldwide. We've seen a massive growth in uh, a middle class around the world over the last 30 years or so. We've seen a big increase in trade and commerce worldwide, and it's had some profound effects. Sweatshops in China. Charlie, sweatshops in China. How about India? How yeah. about uh, right. Vietnam? How about some of these stuff? They don't oppress children like they used to. In other words, Charlie, what you have been talking about with your socialist paradise, you have everybody back on the collective farm wanting to, to uh, do substance farming, and who wants that kind of life? Personally, I like driving a car. I like having the internet. I like living longer. I like having a lot of this stuff. And what is it going to take? It's going to take money. It's going to take investment. It's going to take commerce. It's going to take innovation. And personally, I like it. I think what we are forgetting is a lot of the benefits that we already have in the world and that with a growing economy and a growing middle class, we can uh, see our way forward. Yes. What worries me more than anything else is that we start doing trade restrictions. We start tapping the uh, world commerce down and we start getting back into our protectionist things. The one thing that's really beginning to worry me is we're starting to get back into some of those fascist ideas that happened in the 30s where you get a government guy, you know, you start seeing all the inequality and all this other stuff, and you start seeing these uh, professional dictators rise to power. They always need an enemy to go forward. And usually there's a little bit of prosperity under them for the first few years until their true counterbands are known. You can see this a lot in some of the countries that got their freedom in the 60s in Africa. It's usually the, the first few years is of hope and dreams, and then they stay too long in power. 
and all of a sudden, you know, if you look at Zimbabwe, that's an example. Look at some of the other countries. And then, of course, you have your rampant socialism, like Chavez did in, uh, in uh, Venezuela. And look what's happening now. They're poor. The only real way to prosperity is what Adam Smith did with his invisible hand at the marketplace. You have the pricing and signal mechanisms of a free market. You don't need to coordinate through some central committee. But there are some things that we do have in common that need to be work, roads, bridges, infrastructure, a fire department, a police department, a hospital department, you know, a board of health. There are certain things that government does and does has to do because for the maintenance of the commons. And even Adam Smith in his book, The Wealth of Nations, talked about it. One of the reasons you have a lot of big problem with homelessness in San Francisco is because of the historic districts and the restrictions on the building codes they have in San Francisco because of the uh, restrictive building covenants. They, can't, they won't let you build a big apartment building in San Francisco if it's in a historic district. They won't let you uh, take, take an old established business and uh, put a, put a multi-story high-rise in. And if you really want to solve the homeless problem, perhaps maybe getting rid of some of the zoning regulations where you could uh, actually have a promote investment in some decent housing for people and let, let the rent market determine where it's supposed to go, you might find something. If you have a limited housing stock because of the restrictions on building covenants, you're going to get higher rents because there's not enough. Uh, well, Charlie, tenements may not be exactly what I would call them, but I would call, you know, if you want affordable housing, let the market take it in and see what they can do. We have a lot of open stock on the west side of Chicago here that's virtually not being used. And uh, we have places in the city that uh, could probably benefit from, you know, maybe community investment or something. But the thing is, is that there's so much uh, uh, restrictive covenants with the zoning regulations that you can't take down a, a single story home and put up a multi-story apartment building. Now. I'm not saying that's the end all to end all, but it has a big, big, big uh, hand in why there's homelessness. Now, you may be talking about your tenements, Charlie. Where are they now? Virtually gone. Here's your sweatshops. There's certainly better jobs than uh, what's on the farm fields of the tenements of socialism and your collective farming that are a lot better. In a lot of these countries where they have these so-called uh, sweatshops, the jobs are certainly a lot better than you would find back in your own village. And frankly, I would much rather see a place like China develop, like it's been doing, with their so-called sweatshops because it's only a matter of time before they get out of a little bit better economics there and their children will not be working in those things because of development. And uh, Charlie, as far as I've considered about socialism and your communistic acclamations, they were proven wrong upon the ash heap of history. Your so-called glorious revolution of the Soviet Socialist Republics ended back in 1990, back in 1989, with one of the greatest days in the world, and that was 11 9 89. What happened on that day? The Windows operating system came out and the Berlin Wall came tumbling down. What happened in So when the windows went up, the walls came tumbling down. Well said. Um, let me see if I understand this right. The capitalism is terrific. It is. Yes. It's but it has nothing to do with uh, the homelessness problem. The homeless problem seems to be because there are too many construction restrictions. Yes. <laughs> yes. Part of it. Yeah. Part of it. I don't even know where to go with it. So it's two great, two great common examples of, of, of uh, the failures of uh, socialism is uh, uh, Venezuela in Zimbabwe. Like these countries, which are really like these totalitarian countries, that have these like historic levels of hyperinflation. So uh, I just think that that's, that's really because misrepresentation. There's no rule of law. 
There, there are many, there are many democratic socialist countries in in Europe that are not only doing very well uh, uh, financially, but uh, through a lot of surveys, are showing that people are very, very happy with uh, yeah. sort of a mix of democracy and uh, capitalist ideas, and uh, but with also social socialism as sort of a backup for a people who are struggling or having problems and for the common good. It's sort of a utilitarian approach, and I, I really like that. Um, uh, I, you know, as a, uh, as a citizen, I, I, I try to look at these com this country's problems and, and, uh, and try to summarize. It's like, okay, like what's this our core problem that we're dealing with? And, and you'll hear all these people complaining about problems like uh, just be flag burning, and then they're complaining about homosexuals and the loss of family values and the loss of uh, religious values, or you know, look at all the immigrants creating all these problems, and, um, and and they're just all these problems being thrown around. In my personal opinion, my two cents is that uh, um, is that there's just too much wealth in too few hands. Um, uh, there's uh, the three richest people in the United States have more money than I think it's like the bottom 40% or yeah. it, it's it's that's 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 freaky and then if you lower if you raise it to like the top uh, 300 people then you're talking about two-thirds of the wealth of the country um, the thought that this somehow is either a, has a neutral effect uh, or positive effect, and not a negative effect on our on, our, on democracy um, or the economy. I just think is ludicrous. So that's my approach on like what a core problem this country is. And, and frankly, I don't, I'm not very happy with even how Democrats have dealt with that issue recently in my lifetime. Um, or even the candidates seem to be not very focused on that, the Democrats, certainly not the Republicans. I personally like Bernie Sanders. I, I'm not sure if he really has solutions, but he's a candidate who's talking about the problems of real people, uh, the economic challenges, these incredibly unfair uh, economic imbalances, um, and, and I just like the way that he's just focusing on it, and he's just hammering it home over and over. And, and I think that's reflected by this growing, this groundswell of uh, people who are stepping forward to support him. And it's really, if you, if you think about it, I mean, how, how many, how, what presidential candidate in recent history can you compare to Bernie Sanders? Dennis Kucinich. Huh? Dennis Kucinich. Dennis Kucinich? Did he have that much? He had, he had about the same thing. Well, it gradually. It yeah. built over. It's I wasn't aware that it was at that it was at large. Oh, well, but, he didn't have as much support, but he had the, had same, the same ideas. Idea. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about support. He, he has uh, this message that is hitting people to a point where they're reaching into their pocket and donating dollars. And Bernie Sanders just seems to have this groundswell of support. My big concern is that if he doesn't get the nomination. There's going to be a greater negative impact on the Demo whoever the Democratic nominee is. Um, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure he's going to be effective, but I just really like the fact that he seems to be, in my opinion, focusing on the major problem that this country is facing and the biggest threat to uh, the middle class in the history of this country. So, my two cents. Thanks. All right. All right. Charlie, get up there. Who's next? All right, we got Jonathan. All right, Jonathan. You give them, you tell them, Jonathan. I even went south to We've heard enough nonsense here. Thank you to our speaker. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the United States here, to borrow from a uh, George Orwell phrase, we are subjected to living our lives, read that to mean surviving our wage slaveries, in a not really society, a hyper complex delusion of not really new and maintained infrastructure, not really very good public transit choices, not really nutritious food and water that we can afford, not really living wage jobs, not really accessible communities for our brothers and sisters with disabilities, 
not really high skills, 21st century quality public education, not really free speech, not really free press, not really democratic elections, as we just recently saw in Iowa, where apparently it's uh, easier to uh, go to an ATM to get an accurate count of numbers than to go to an election where we claim to be the experts on the globe for election integrity, which is funny as hell. You know, but it wasn't Russia this time, was it? No, the Democratic Party. Not really fair opportunities to build small businesses. Not really open and honest government. Not really a kind and nurturing safe place to raise our children. Not really where we can age with dignity and autonomy. Not really a planet where those who have the greatest power live in balance with Mother Nature. <coughs> Not really an environment where the structure of the workplace <coughs> empowers workers as the number one receivers of the accomplishments, blessings, and outstanding results of our works. Our contributions to our jobs are extraordinarily greater than the prosperity we are able to achieve if we're achieving any at all, as our speaker pointed out this evening. Not really justice, not really health care, not really of all, by all, for all, not really ours. Not really any of the familiar rhetoric buzz phrases about peace and diplomacy see commonly stated during the silly season which we find ourselves and yet status quacks and that's what I like to call uh, mainstream airwaves and people who slavishly believe that only the truth can be acquired from mainstream newspapers magazines radio and television continue to label us as lazy Status quacks continue to label us as unworthy. Status quacks continue to throw us larger crumbs and claim, it just put a band-aid on it, stop whining, trick-or-treat thin civic policy, why don't you all just go buy a winning lottery ticket? Nonsense. Each time we miraculously get them to negotiate, which that's what an election season is. It's a negotiation between we the people and our legislature, which serves us. It's not like on The Apprentice, where he's our boss. Okay, apparently 61 million Americans don't realize that, which is scary as fruit smoothie. I almost said a cuss word there, too. I'm being very careful to keep it as classy as our uh, noteworthy speaker has kept it this evening. I appreciate that and respect that. We live in a not really reality at a time when the choices we are facing are not simple fork in the road decisions and in which we can't go backwards if we refuse to strictly adhere to math and science and common sense. We don't have a magic pass. Is it because we're working class? We don't get out of jail for free. Is it because we lack the knee? It's a not really trap set by status quacks whose pockets are overflowing with Benjamins, Andrews, Georges, and Abrahams. It's a not really trap set by status hacks whose pockets overflow with greenbacks, but they should really be called bloodbacks. Wow. The wisdom of history has now looked us in the mirror, and neither of us is blinking. Instead of panic or defensiveness, instead of shouting or turning away, instead of aggression or denial, instead of ego or forfeit, let's respond with an oddly secure nod of solidarity. Let's be our absolute best in all we are and all we continue to diligently fight for. Not losers, not quitters, not extinction harvesters, fearless earth peoples. So from uh, one fearless earth people to another, I'd like to thank our speaker tonight. I wish you well on your campaign. Uh, Sounds like you don't have that much money, so uh, you need our solidarity now more than ever. Those of us who want a planet of all, by all, for all, no matter what our political ideologies are. I'm not a libertarian. I'm pretty outspoken about that, pretty opinionated about that, but I try not to be because I want the best solutions to win. I want there to be full turnout, and if the best solution is somebody else's solution, great. 
Okay, I fight for my solution, but not at the expense of your right to fight for your solution. Because I know all the puzzle pieces do fit, and that's what King taught us. All right, Charlie, you want to hear about your communism? From the famines, purges, and gulags of the Soviet Union to Mao's great leap forward to the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge, communists have killed more than 100 million people over the last century, and countless people still suffer. You know, um, and capitalists kill people too. Capitalists are the ones who run the, mili the, the, the military-industrial complex in this country. Through the Germany and making, deal. And making Germany billions of dollars on weapons to murder millions right, of people. David, let the man it cuts speak. both ways. The problem speak is, is that time. we right. didn't right. have the, time. the scourge of communism on us. That. We might have not an excuse to make those weapons and stuff the to protect the ourselves States. against this scourge. The, the Berlin United Wall States. fell in 1989, but communism didn't. 100 years after the Bolshevik Revolution, one-fifth of the world's population still lives under single-party communist regimes in China, Cuba, Laos, North Korea, and Vietnam. And they're still oppressed. If you haven't got enough in there to speak without that machine, sit out. All right, let's thank our speaker again. And really nice and good luck in your campaign. Your first, where is he at? Oh, there you go. All right, Andy, you're doing pretty good. Bringing a lot of energy to the contest here. All right, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Since when are you not uh, eclectic? Uh, all right, in Andy's neighborhood, in the future America, uh, that was my thought. The way I perceive it, and I tried to figure this out, there seems to be one guy with $50 million living in a fancy house and 500 homeless people. And apparently he and the party he's affiliated with accept this. Uh, it's acceptable because uh, they want a flat tax. It means nothing will change. So they accept that condition, that arrangement, and want to see it continue. Uh, one of the amazing thing is, I counted in to use the word equality probably seven, eight, or ten times, and yet at the same time he's talking about equality, he's advocating a flat tax, which is the antithesis of bringing about equality. So how do you achieve equality and advocate policies that are just the opposite? Uh, I'm going to switch to trades and crafts. Actually, I've been affiliated with it. And in my office uh, downtown is uh, adjacent to the apprentice programs of the Department of Labor and the various unions. And you advocate trades and crafts to, as a means of upward mobility, and that's very commendable. However, again, the party that you're affiliated with in your own statements, you object to both the government, which would be the Department of Labor, and the Libertarian Party, who objects to the existence of unions. So I don't know how you could have apprenticeship programs who would manage or operate them if you're going to get rid of the people who presently do it. But do you think the industry, perhaps, I guess? Maybe. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, we got a planned economy. Uh, I asked this question. I, you know, I said I seem to agree that we need thirty-three dollars per hour. Uh, and, and Timothy, I'm sorry, you need a bit more than seven twenty-five. There's so much rich already. You can't afford a place to live anywhere at seven twenty-five. There's been so many studies I've seen that people can't find apartments anywhere in the nation and earning that amount of money, it's like $18,000 per year or something. We had the homeless organization here and they said that was the minimal amount that one had to earn in order to escape 
homelessness. So you're right at the cusp if you have no unforeseen conditions, and I guess live frugally, uh, you may be able to have your own apartment. And it has nothing to do with codes, anything. This is nationwide figures. I recommend you keep up with this. Now, another thing is, uh, Timothy, uh, there's a problem about arguing from example. From example, there's a counterexample. You give some examples of socialist countries, well, which have, you know, uh, have different cultural histories and lineage. Uh, there's about 193 countries on Earth, and all sorts of economies. Uh, some successful, some failure, and given periods of time, even within this own country, uh, I believe within the past, in 2008, uh, the capitalist free market enterprise system was an absolute and total failure. Yeah, really. And uh, was going under and required an infusion of billions of dollars by the government itself in order to keep capitalism. That's because and you're saying that you maintain that another system is a failure when we're living in a country that required they used the term bailout. Uh, that's, that's not a positive term. Uh, it was in severe distress. Uh, we changed precedence because of it. Uh, the economy was a disaster. People were not prospering. People were unemployed. People were homeless. Human needs were not try. being met. Anyone and, supporting and then you said you maintain this to be the system that we should embrace again. Well, yes. You know, we learn by you learn if you see something fail. You know, I, I said you know this didn't look like it was doing too well. That's because it was so a guy like Tim comes along and says. Oh, that looks real good to me. It still does. You're the one who tried to sell the five plan. Whereas another individual, such as myself, says, perhaps there's alternatives to this, because it appears it had some sure. flaws in in its operation, and perhaps we should make some adjustments, uh, because that was precipitously close. Uh, I give you figures here before. What recession are, are we in, or depression have we had in the U.S. history? Is this eighth or ninth in the history of the United States? So it's it's not been a positive thing. Um, you mentioned you don't like collective farms where people work together uh, to produce food. I've seen photos of this, you know, the people really enjoyed that. <laughs> they did. Yes. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they yeah. did. Yeah, so I certainly would. Now, you used to work on a corporate farm in the United States. I was just reading and posting this week, corporate agriculture in the United States. As a matter of fact, they, it's caused problems within the rural communities because uh, they're disastrous to the areas that you're situated in. Uh, they're not producing good food for the consumer. Uh, so if you measure that, I don't know what measure of success is. I guess making money is it. Now, I, you know, collective enterprises have been common in agriculture <coughs> since ancient times. Since agriculture. <laughs> yeah, since agriculture. You know, uh, they saw the benefits of cooperative efforts in bringing in the harvest, or planting the crops. Uh, the barn raising is a feature um, where I lived in Pennsylvania that historically was the, the thing. I lived in rural areas, and if there was a personal disaster, the community came to your aid. Mm -hmm. Not government, it was the community. So uh, I think, you know, there's, so you tell me your corporate farm is going to do that. I, I really don't Certainly think a so. lot more efficient you know, than uh, uh, Yeah, they, no, they put 30,000 pigs and 
and, and, and you know, actually, I won't get into it. But anyhow, all right, good luck on your campaign. It's very interesting. And come again, tell us uh, when you got another one in you. All right. Don't oh, yeah. believe the false promises of socialism. You promise everything under the sun, but yet it never yeah. happens. Don't drink the Kool-Aid, Charlie. People enjoy collective agriculture. What about all the people that Stalin forced yeah. onto collective farms in the 1920s? And as a result, there was man-made starvation in the Soviet Union as a result. So, no, I don't think that people enjoy being put on No, those farms. were the people that opposed the collective And then, then Why don't you get the story straight? Why don't you? Those were the people and then who with regard, And then with regard to 1929, well, Franklin Roosevelt, who certainly was a capitalist, addressed most of those issues with the New Deal, and which brought about not only greater enforcement of securities regulations, and which also brought about vast reforms so that more Americans got a greater share of what they produced. At least that was true until relatively recent times where it's gotten out of whack again. So I'm sorry, I'm not a believer in socialism. Granted, capitalism is far from perfect. Capital, it's, the real problem is it isn't that capitalism is so great, it's that everything else has been tried is so much worse. Yeah, Thank why don't you. you make seven and twenty-five an hour? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us all we'll get the last is. word after I get this last quote in. Yeah. Mr. Leslie, no, all right, Christopher. We talked yeah, last night on the phone and this specifically addressed oh, to my brother. And you, Charlie, anyone supporting a Bernie presidency needs to open a history textbook. Socialism sounds great because it's gift wrapped with utopian promises of a more fair, equal, and moral society, and of course, lots of free things. It just never happens. Don't fall for it this time. We can look up stuff on the internet. We don't need you to get up there. Let's let our speaker. Let's let our speaker get the last word in. Okay, thank you. Uh, All right. This is the time I do what? You speak the last yeah, word and yeah, then we you, you get the last the word, you get respond to the rebuttals. You decide to give up being a libertarian and join with the rest of us. You get the last word and we readjourn. <clears throat> so here's what I'm going to say. When it comes to Donald Trump and his policies, because Donald Trump identifies himself as an evangelical Christian, I hold him to the word. And what the word says to him with his policies is you're a hypocrite. That's what I tell him. Because last time I read the scriptures, it says, welcome the foreigners, because at one time you was a foreigner in your land. So say that, that's, say that. that's, that's what I tell him. Two, what I tell him is let the people go. The Brennan Justice Foundation wrote an article, a uh, paper, to the next president. And what they said is if Donald Trump would fully fund the First Step Act. So granted, he signed the First Step Act, which I want to say it started with George Bush from the Second Chance Act initiative, then Barack Obama, the Fair Sentencing Act, then Donald Trump, the First Step Act. Last time I heard, bases is loaded and only an ex-offender can bring us home. So that's how I look at that. But with Donald Trump, he didn't even fund fully fund the First Step Act, but somehow they were able to pass the bill $78 billion for defense funding. So our priorities is wrong because we've got money for war but cannot feed the poor. That's been that way and it needs to change. You want to know how to balance the budget, you have a $564 billion appropriated towards defense funding and military, but you do not have a budget that's sustainable for education, not indoctrination, education, or to eradicate poverty. We have 50 million people living below the poverty level. The money that was spent in the 2016 election could have eradicated poverty, funded health care, did so much more. Our people who are running for office do not really have a solid plan because if they did, they put their money where their mouth is. I'm not trying to raise millions of dollars, I'm trying to raise awareness. So if I get the money, it's to sustain me based on the salary that a person who is running for president. All we need is $65,000 a year. How am I going to get that sustainability for Andy? With my hood candidate CD. 
with the two books that I have that are co-authoring people because I believe in entrepreneurship and taking my own story, building a, a base for me. Now, I have had people donate some money, and I'm not complaining because I do need it, but I'm not depending on that for my message because I am the message. I am the message. Donald Trump will never stand a chance in with me in any dialogue because I'm not going to debate about helping the people. You don't debate about helping people. That's something that you talk about, a solution that works for all. Now, if Donald Trump has uh, uh, brought the economy back in for African Americans, great, congratulations. But have you been the right representative for all? No. Bernie Sanders is running on criminal justice reform. I respect Bernie Sanders, but you have 2019 cases in your own state, Vermont, of police brutality. Why are you not fixing it at home? You plan to, you promise to change in the in the in the, the world, but you won't fix it at home. The senator can't fix the state. No, the senator can do exactly what I'm doing: filing suits against the unequal. Racial profiling, violation of the Fourth Amendment. You can do that because you have the ability to call other attorneys to do it. The the, the coalition to end money bail that they're talking about. I'm not. A, I'm I'm, a, I'm in favor of it as long as you have an assessment before the people get out of jail. You just can't say it's a violation to have somebody in jail on a bond that's so high, and then you they done beat up somebody or or rob somebody, and that person done press charges against them, and then they get out and go kill them. You got to make sure people's mindset is straight. So to try to have a message that's going to appease all, my appeasing all is administering justice to the oppressed, the widows, the fatherless, the orphans. That's the plan. And you cannot get that plan done by promising a handout. The handout is what's got us in the situation we are now, depending on government to give us every damn That's thing. Right. Get up and do something for yourself one time. That's right. How about that? Well and if you need some tools and resources, as a government, we will aid and assist you. Would we're you not saying as a libertarian we're going to say, oh, it's just one way or another way. We're saying you need no. tools and resources to get it done, and our limited government will help you. We're not going to oppress you and give you everything. And if Bernie Sanders raising millions and millions of dollars, why can't you implement your plan with the millions of dollars that you're raising? That's a waste of people's money. Oh, that's right. It's a waste. <laughs> what do you mean by implement? <laughs> if I my plan right now, which I'm I share with you, Sanders. I'm talking about any one of the candidates, it's any one of them. But let's say if, on if, campaign if you're funds. raising millions of dollars for what you're going to do. Well, you gotta spend the money to get on TV. But does it take millions of dollars to do that? More than millions. No, yes. we think it does. He's spending it on the TV. No, that's what he's telling us he's doing. Wait a minute, you don't believe him? I don't believe nothing until I see it in black and white. Do you think a candidate can raise as much money as the budget of the United States? Is this your premise? I'm telling you this, the, 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 the salary of the president is $400,000, and he gets $50,000 to spend for a budget per year. If you can't run your campaign on $450,000, you're not ready to balance a budget. That's right. That's what you're not ready to do, because you're trying to raise more money than with the job. Excuse that's, me? That's about a half hour on national television. Do you need national television when you're serving the people? How much money did Jesus raise and he done changed the whole world with that message? That's true. I'm just asking. How much money did Dr. King make when he had the I Have a Dream speech? No, the only difference in the time is, is that we're believing that that's what we need. You Would think you, it, uh, King right this day was still trying what he was trying? He'd get the same exposure now as he did then? Well, different world now. No, it's not a different world. We think it's a different world because right now we have social media, meaning we can spend less money. All you have to do is prove your position and stand true on what you're doing. I guarantee you I will not need millions of dollars to run this campaign. I am the hood candidate. I am the one everybody's been waiting for. Like, it's about time. When I sit down with Farrakhan's son, and he's like, brother, this is what we've been waiting for. Somebody that walks in integrity, principle, character, honesty. That's what we need, transparency. That's what we need. We don't need to raise billions of dollars to do that. We don't. You gotta get the word out, right? 
Bloomberg spends his own money. And this is what I would say. The money he stole. Well, whatever he got, I don't know his background. I'm just going to say he spends his own money. That's what a candidate should do. Spend your own money if you're going to run for office. Stop raising money off the people that are oppressed. So you're you talking about them. only millionaires run for No, I'm not saying I'm not a millionaire. I'm a dollarnaire. You might not win. <laughs> And guess what? Like I said before, my matter. message stays the same. Exactly right. That's the difference. You. I don't need to win to make people aware that I we have a solution that. inside of us. If this is the platform that God has given me to wake the world up, to say we are the hate and we are the love, we are the solution, then this is what I'm going to do. And I agree with you. There's no other candidate that's been to the funerals of the mass shooting. All you're talking about is changing laws. I'm talking about getting NAMI, fund their budget, help them expand what NAMI is doing, National Association of Mental, I don't know what the MI stands for, but they only use people who've been through it. Don't come give me somebody that's got some book knowledge and you ain't never had no experience. You can't solve street violence if you ain't never been in the streets violent. You just talking. Yeah, you, you remember the October 22nd movement? Was that before your time? Which October 22nd? That's a good month. That's my birthday. That's month. when they were shoot. The police were killing kids on the south side. We got together and started a thing called October 22nd because that's when the first kid got killed that we knew of. And we started going downtown and things. Couldn't change a goddamn thing. We were out there all the time. I tell you this. Every candidate that's running for Not president. That we shouldn't have done it. Right, I agree. Every candidate that's running for president right now, I'll go down the list. Healthcare, already existed with Rosen, Harris Rosen out of Florida. He already has a health care plan. Black Panther Party had health care clinics. They didn't do a vote, they didn't pass a budget. That's number one. If you're talking about criminal justice reform, the ACLU and the NAACP have been doing this for over 100 years. What are you going to do that they haven't already done? So you're just talking some bull crap, saying what you're going to do. If you don't empower the people that are already doing it, immigration reform, abolish ICE, period. Absolutely. What, what do you need to, what do we got to talk about it for? Because it didn't come out until 2001, and what we did is we are afraid. We operate at this, this condition of fear to say, oh, I got to do this because I'm afraid. No, respect people. We'll be paying immigrants you won't to come here in to have 20 that years. Fear. So you have immigration reform, human rights. That's your right as a human. My personal belief does not become law. And that's what the candidates are doing. They have a personal agenda. Well, I'm pro-life. I'm pro-choice. Well, I'm going to make a law, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. No, you should have the choice to do whatever you want to do. I don't agree with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer you a choice. Here's a choice. Do you want to do that choice? If you don't want to do that choice, that's between you and your creator based on what the Declaration of Independence say. I'm not going to penalize you for a choice, but what I have come up with is strap it up. My friend Jay Prince got a condom company, so I'm holding the males accountable to say, stay strapped, wrap it up, or let's start teaching abstinence again in school. Because I know when you was in school, they were teaching abstinence. See, all we're doing is looking at the problem. We're not talking about the solution. The solution is stop having sex until you get married. Let's go back to morals and principles and family values. I don't think human animal works that way. Well, it's got to start working that way because I got a three-year-old granddaughter that she's not going to grow up in the same society that we've grown up in. I'm going to make that change difference for her by any means necessary. Wow. Yeah, Period. Okay. There ain't no going to be no other way. Right. There's no other way. Are you uh, finished, my friend? If you're kicking me out, I'm finished. No, I'm not kicking you out. You want a little more time? We got money still. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm telling you right now. So when you say my brother over there, I am ready to go head to head with Donald Trump on any one of his policies. I'm done background checks on Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. Uh, uh, well, well, hell, let's just talk about the Yang Gang when he was trying. I'm gonna give everybody a thousand dollars. Get that pie out of the sky story. That's why he out the race right now. All that money he raised, knowing dang well he didn't have no solution because he's an entrepreneur, a businessman. Why you lying to the people? That's what he was doing, raising money, lying to the people. There needs to be accountability for that. That's what needs to happen, and we're not holding people accountable. You know why I chose the Libertarian Party? Because their principles lined up. I started out as an independent, and I'm telling you right now, that was a giant, a Goliath that I was not going to be able to handle. And then I saw the Libertarian Party principle of freedom, limited government. But the freedom part is what got me, the party of principle, morals. Well, hell, that's what we need in society. That's what we need. There's never going to be one perfect party. But when the man steps up 
as a libertarian, standing on the principle, saying, listen, I can't do this by myself. So if you're a Democrat with, with, with morals and principles, let's do this. If you're a Republican with morals and principles, let's do this. If you're a Green Party, if you're an independent, the if you care. The Libertarian Party is the most unethical party that's ever been. And that's your position no, on it. No, that's true from ethics. That's, that's your position on it. That the Libertarian Party has had to fight just no. like everybody no. else. The, the wobbly system attack. between the Democrats Hitler's and the Republicans have passed laws which they conspired. It's a conspiracy is what they've done yeah, to keep other people out. Christianity. Excuse me? Yeah, think this is the Christianity. What about Christianity? Libertarian values. What about them? They don't really care what happens to people. How do you know that? Because I so. their platform. I'm a libertarian and I care about all people. So get rid of the label. You are not a real libertarian. I am a real human. You're a human. Not a real libertarian. How come I'm not? I got it right here on my thing. I tell you what, I appreciate you guys. I definitely will be back um, sometime. Whenever the spirit needs me to come back, I met some great people in here tonight. And when I become the president in 2021, one of my stops will be back here at Dapper's. And Charlie is going to ride with me shotgun. Let's go, Charlie. Give us a journey. Take the salt shaker and gamble us out. Just say the college is adjourned. The college is adjourned. Thank you very much, sir, for speaking tonight. We're done. Yeah, yeah. They all talk about.